His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told the on dance will never get old. Hello, and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. If you've ever looked for housing on Long Island, you know that it's complicated. I moved out here almost 30 years ago, and we first started out renting the first floor of a very old house about 20 feet away from the Montauk line of the Long Island Railroad. Upstairs was a single mother Irish immigrant with her two daughters, and within a year we were moving because the landlord, unbeknownst to us, had been showing the house and sold it out from under us. And that's just a drop in the bucket, I'm sure all of you could tell your own renting, buying, owning stories on Long Island Well, this episode's for you. We are diving into how did we get here? Why is it like this? How could it have been different? We're covering everything from Levittown to Lyndon Johnson to Yes, Evil Landlords. You'll see large-scale federal spending, competing bus lines, the Hop Hog Industrial Park, and so much more. This was recorded a few weeks ago just at the beginning of the spring semester. So let's go to school with today's very special guest. My name's Tim Keo, and Tim is fine for the, for the purpose of the podcast. <laughs> okay, great, Tim. And thank you for joining us. We're on Libsyn Connect, and I, I know you're a professor at Queensboro Community College. How's your semester going since we're talking early on? It actually starts two days from now. I'm, I'm very oh, so you're lucky. I'm very nice. lucky, Good yes, yes. <laughs> so it's going great right now. Not too long ago, I, I interviewed a, a cultural historian who had written a book on the creation of mid-20th century Long Island. And I think you're a great companion piece to that because you're looking at it from, a, I think, a very different or specific lens. Do you want to say the name of your book? And we'll dive in from there. Sure. Uh, my, my book is called In Levittown's Shadow, uh, Poverty in America's Wealthiest Postwar Suburb. Um, and as you mentioned here, it's a kind of broad history um, from 1920 to roughly, I try to get to the present, basically, at least the 2010s. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, before we dive into that, I, I, since I know you're... I, or I believe you're, you're local. Do you want to just situate yourself for us on Long Island? What's been your experience? Oh, so where you're from? So I was born and raised here. I was born in Rockville Center, uh, spent a little bit in Baldwin, then I mostly spent most of my life in Farmingdale. Um, okay. And then after about 10 years living in Queens, we actually, during the pandemic, moved back to Farmingdale. <laughs> and, and what got you into the field of history? Honestly, it was uh, Nassau Community College. I, that's where I went for my first two years of college. Um, and I fell in love. I, I was into history even as a kid and things, but that's when I was like, oh, I want to be an historian. And that was mainly uh, there at Nassau Community College. What's your, what would you say is your field or your concentration as a historian? Yeah, so I do American history, of course, and I do mostly urban history. And uh, there's a subfield, we call it the sub subfield of suburban history. So <laughs> um, it's a little tiny field within the broader urban history of America. Great. So let, let's dive into it. And actually, it's, it's interesting. Although Levittown's in the in the title, you really do spend more time, so to speak, in the shadows or around it. This might be hard to or not fair to ask you, but do you want to give us the main thesis or argument of your book? Sure. Um, essentially, the argument is that Long Island's prosperity, as well as the poverty that exists on Long Island, and a surprising number of people who actually were poor, um, really rested on federal policy. Um, in the post-war period. And while we're largely familiar with the Federal Housing Administration and as well as the VA loans that made people able to move into homes in like Levittown and elsewhere, we're less, we let talk less about the huge defense spending that created the well paying massive jobs on Long Island, um, responsible for about one in six jobs across Long Island. And together, these military contracts and labor protections lifted about 400,000 families into economic security. But there was other people who really did necessary work, building the Cape Cods, mowing the lawn, stocking department store shelves, working in the local factories. And they helped make suburbia possible and suburban prosperity possible, but they didn't see the benefits and they ended up living in poverty. 
So I kind of use Long Island to understand how inequality developed after World War II and even to the present, how it changed, and hopefully in many ways to kind of give us some ideas about how we can maybe deal with poverty in the 21st century. Um, I might be backtracking a little, but as we're talking about the 20th century, there's there's a few points I pulled out that kind of spoke to me. And one is even before the war, so early 20th century, you, you talk about the uh, estate economy or, or you know the, the great estates. People know the Gold Coast and the many other enclaves of the wealthy. But those you portray them sometimes as sort of small businesses, as employers and, and sources of housing. Just to set the scene, do you want to say just a little bit about this pre-war landscape of that economy? Sure, yeah. So I kind of begin the story at the turn of the 20th century, as you mentioned. And that's when all these wealthy people were moving out to Long Island, building these gigantic estates. I mean, some of the biggest estates, not history of the world per se, you know, compared to medieval castles, but <laughs> big in the modern era. Uh, and you mentioned these were small businesses. And essentially, I divide Long Island before World War II into two kind of groups of people. There's the people who commute to the city or make their money in the city somehow, you know, if they're industrial titans. And they'd live well. And there's the people who work on the island. And they mostly serve those people who commute to the city. And they don't live so well, necessarily. And some of these estates, like I mentioned, Comset, um, probably people know Comset State Park by Marshall Fields' estate. He employed 400 people. You know, that's, that's like a mega, that's like an Amazon warehouse <laughs> in terms of employment. And a lot of these large estates had 50 to 100 employees. They're like a Target or, or you know, a local Walmart or something. And so essentially these estates, I mean, they stretched from the border of Queens to Suffolk County in uninterrupted sequence on the North Shore of Long Island, for example. I think it was like 600 estates. They were these little tiny employers, you know, like, again, a bunch of Targets, CVSs and McDonald's all the way out. And they had thousands and thousands of employees, people doing all sorts of work, taking care of children, cleaning the homes, dealing with the vegetation outside. Uh, doing chimney work, construction, everything else. And some of these people were paid okay. But as I mentioned, many more were paid pretty low. And therefore, they had to find kind of housing in these shadows and these nooks and crannies outside that state economy. So, and and let's, um, I, I haven't really talked to many people about the depression on Long Island. So it's leading up to the war, which which kind of, as you'll explain, jumpstarts everything. What was the, the depression, Any any anything unique about this situation on Long Island or did that bring about any changes? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because the one thing I found in the research, and I looked through the WPA roles and the different you know, New Deal programs and how they worked. Of course, a lot of people were on, I think one in five workers on the island were um, getting relief from New Deal programs in like 1933, which is like the worst of the depression, worst year. Um, that's pretty typical across the country, but it's still no lower here. But the one thing I, uh, it's very clear it's happening during the New Deal is, and it makes sense, right? They're not, they're not anticipating the post-war period. <laughs> so what they're really doing is they're kind of still building as if the estate society exists. I mean, if you think about one of the big projects on Long Island during the, new, uh, the Depression was Bethpage State Park, right? That's a public golf course, but it's a golf course. And, you know, there were 27 private clubs in Nassau County alone for golf courses. So they're building another golf course for people who can afford to golf, especially in the early 20th century. It's not that many. Um, you know, they're putting sidewalks down, they help building your beachside areas, and they're mostly still building for that kind of tourist and residential suburbia that had existed already. And they're kind of reinforcing that. And it's World War II that will kind of erase that old suburbia. And that's what really breaks the chain. And yet, so did that we're up to like the mid 1930s now, but I think you document and it's been shown that Long Island was attracting, you know, so the, the, I don't want to say myth, but but the Long Island or Nassau and Suffolk as uh, the land of the wealthy and maybe a place you, you talk about the, the great migration and workers coming up from the south. So people were coming into Long Island, I guess, what, expecting that, that it would be the land of milk and honey for them or? You mean like uh, less less well off people you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the, the people that would go to work on the estates, they, they saw it worth coming here, whether they knew the situation here or not. Yeah, and it's funny you, you say that because I think it was one in six black Southerners, especially, moved straight to suburbs when they moved to the north. You know, it was a big migration of black Southerners to northern cities in the early 20th century. But about one in six didn't go to cities. They came to Long Island or other suburbs like hmm. outside of Boston, et cetera. And most of the time, they were actually following literal other family members who had come up and sent letters back saying, hey, things are better here. Um, and it seems like they were, at least relatively speaking, right? They're not going to become millionaires. <laughs> 
but they're going to be doing slightly better than they had been doing in North Carolina, South Carolina, or elsewhere. What's also interesting I found is that a lot of the Black Southerners moving from places like Aiken, South Carolina, they're actually coming from resort communities in the South and moving to sometimes even literally work for the same family in the North Uh, because these families have, mm -hmm. you know, winter resorts in the South and then they have their main estate at home. And so they actually might be calling up other family members to come and take care of their horses or their estate and things like that. So these people are actually recruited almost sometimes by wealthy estate owners to come North. Um, The other side of it is sometimes like in Glen Cove, I found construction companies would try to undercut the wages of the workers they were using by bringing in Southerners and, you know, migrants essentially to pay them less. And that was a big issue, especially in Glen Cove between like Italian Americans who had done construction and the largely new black workforce coming in the 1920s and 30s. And there was animosity as the employers were preferring the cheaper labor. And would you say population wise, it's still in, in terms of the scale of this we haven't hit the boom yet, right? With the influx of people with the war effort. Yeah. I mean, it's actually interesting you say that because Nassau County, Queens, I think was the fastest growing, don't quote me on this, mm-hmm. but I think it was the fastest growing uh, county in America in like 1920s or 10s. Nassau County, it might've been the fastest growing in the 20s, but it was one of the fastest growing. Um, so there was that first suburban boom, but the 30s, of course, kills that boom. No one can move out and get a house easily <laughs> with the high foreclosure rate. And World War II is a boom in jobs, but the federal government actually limited migration to Long Island um, because they felt like Long Island had enough of a labor force. And they had this commission called the War, uh, the War Manpower Commission that actually determined what areas of the country needed workers and what areas countries didn't. And so Long Island was considered safe. So it actually wasn't huge population growth during World War II. It's really after World War II, as we know, oh, okay. it takes off. Yeah, I hadn't heard that. So how did they enforce that? Um, you know, no new people, I guess, rule or... Yeah, so it's funny. They didn't enforce it per se, but they didn't encourage okay. migration, uh, meaning, you know, like Los Angeles or outside of Michigan or the whole West, essentially, right? They actually are encouraging people to move out there, providing housing, building this stuff, setting them up. Um, and Long Island, they preferred to make use of the existing population. And that meant as they hired every single man they could find that wasn't uh, drafted, they started going to women and actually sometimes going door to door to housewives and being like, hey, we have you know daycare center. <laughs> you put your kid in there and come work for Republic or Grumman. And they were really, the, the government was not forcing people not to move, but they were really, really trying to encourage locals to work. And one of the reasons they were doing that is because the government didn't want to spend money building housing on the island because there was already some housing stock. You know, that's a material issue and they really put the material to the war effort. So- they're looking to use existing people and really existing housing to try to staff these factories. Um, however, they do have trains running from New York City out to Long Island to Farmingdale, specifically in Bethpage, for city workers to come out and work. So it's not like they're limiting it. They're just not having a, a massive migration. In the development of the war years, was it pretty much the feds were running the show You know, in terms of the big picture decisions or how much of the, were the local authorities involved in any of this? Yeah, it's a great uh, point. And I would say the federal government was running the show because, for example, the FHA barely insured any homes. But the only homes that were built during World War II were around Farmingdale and around Bethpage and Uniondale, the Mitchell Field. Otherwise, there's basically barely any housing built on the island. And so if you don't have the money, if the government isn't insuring housing development, people aren't building homes, plus materials are so expensive. And then, of course, the government is building these factories, sometimes literally, or at least funding the development of the of Republic and Grumman's growth. So they're really running the show. And so what's the picture of Long Island after the, the war ends? So we, we, you alluded to it. So we had Grumman creating, you know, and Republic Aviation creating fighter planes and a lot of other, uh, Perry Gyroscope was, I think, in Brooklyn. Um, so a lot of industry pumping out, you know, war material and not, not adding to housing stock, but I guess affording good wages for people. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, just as a sidebar, but you know, people had to live somewhere. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. And you know, since so much is going on in Farmingdale and Bethpage, as well as you mentioned, Lake Success was one of Sperry's factories and um, Great Neck was another one. Of course, you mentioned okay. Brooklyn's the main deal. So you're right about that. Um, but because these areas were the few areas where these 100,000 jobs, essentially, in this kind of surrounding area, what, they, what the government encourages, like in Farmingdale and Bethpage, is for people to actually rent out their homes. And there's even cases I have in the book of like literal 
you know, people basically just sleeping in beds and then sharing beds, <laughs> hmm. you know, because ha- there's such a housing crunch. And so Farmingdale's like run in with tons of these like rented out apartments and basements and second floors and everything else as, as workers come in sometimes for the week. But to answer your question, it's a big issue at the end of World War II because, you know, these defense contracts end, the war ends, and everyone's kind of afraid, like, we're going to lose our jobs. Um, in fact, Grumman fires everybody, <laughs> lays everyone off, I should say, not fires. And then they begin calling some people back for their post-war plans. And Republic lays off a huge number of people. And so a lot of Long Islanders, actually, there's a big conference in Garden City, the Garden City Hotel, where they're kind of making this case for like, we should keep these factories open. You know, <laughs> Why can't we build you know, trains and, and, and stuff for the home front? We don't need to keep building planes. There's no more war. Um, they don't get listened to. One, one guy actually, Liberty Aircraft Products, they made engines. And the president actually was saying, let's make a, a train system that runs north, south, and Long Island. We have the Long Island Railroad. What about you know, a train infrastructure? <laughs> um, and they have all these ideas they're shooting out there, but they need federal funding, and the government ultimately doesn't do that. And that leads us into a very different development after World War II. So, so did the government, was it sort of exhaustion or, or lack of funding? Like you say, the, the, the policy decisions coming out of the war, I mean, had, had the government had a housing policy, a coherent ho- housing policy up till then? or? Yeah, I mean, up and really we had, there was kind of two tracks of housing, right? The, um, the federal government during the Depression, of course, funded public housing. There was a lot of public housing built. And then there was also the FHA, which, of course, in basically ensures private housing development, right? It tells a, a lender or builder, hey, you build that house and you lend it to somebody, that loan doesn't work out, we will bail you out. Not the person who bought the house, but the bank. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that gave banks free reign to just build. The problem is really they restricted that building during World War II. And then once the war ends, they open up that restriction. And that leads to Levittown and you know, the dozens and dozens and hundreds of other subdivisions that or just like Levittown across Long Island. Right. And, and like I said, we have a previous episode that gets to some of the, you know, the scope and scale of, of Levittown. But so you're taking us metaphorically into the shadows. So do you want to talk about that parallel development as Levittown was booming and, you know, the, getting all the headlines? What, what were you studying about what was happening around the edges? Yeah. So one thing I looked at, I'm not sure if the other culture stream talked about this, but um, one thing I looked at is how did Levitt, you know, Levitt and Sons get their price point so low? Um, you know, Levitt houses were like $8,000. Um, in today's money, it's like $105,000. I don't know where you could find. If you could get that, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, and $8,000, that's like a shed at this point. So, you know, um, unbelievably cheap. And the question is, how did Levitt do it? And we know this story typically, right? The story is Levitt used uh, assembly line techniques. They manufacture a lot of the stuff in factories and they trucked it there. He had this really efficient system of like dumping all the supplies and then you know, one person would have like blue paint and one painter would have white paint. They just go house to house doing the same color. However, there's another element to it. And of course, in most efficiency, whether you go back to butchers and, you know, the mid 19th century or Uber today, it's really about kind of making workers work differently. And um, the main thing he did is he didn't really have subcontractors, meaning they didn't do bids with different contractors to determine who's going to do the work. Instead, he had the subcontractors working for, oh, I'm sorry, he, I mean, they had the subcontractors working for them. They gave them fees. And so they didn't pay them for the hours they worked. They paid them for the work done in the day. So that incentivized them to do work faster. And of course, this was also a way to get around unions because unions would ask for hourly work, essentially, and they would want bids. And there was two strikes against Levittown or two attempted strikes, but they never happened. And that's mainly... They are, the evidence points to in a Supreme uh, Court case that this guy, Bill uh, William um, Bull de Koning, or Bill de Koning, he was the kind of uh, construction trades union czar. He's like a Jimmy Hoffa of Long Island. <laughs> and he uh, he essentially did a corruption. He, he worked with subcont- our contractor Long Island, and he told him, listen, we won't ever strike against you as long as you basically kick back um, $8 for every concrete foundation you build. You put $8 in the union welfare fund. You do that, no trouble. And you can hire non-union workers and you can do what you want. Just kick back that money to us. And he was caught doing this with about 250 contractors, which is a lot. Um, And about 40,000 homes they were involved in. And so evidence points to them basically shutting down this potential strikes, which would have kind of brought Levitt's very aggressive practices into kind of relief. Um, you know, and everyone would have known. Instead, what happens is workers do it, 
and many are non-union. Some were paid well, some were paid very low. And the construction industry on the island actually ends up being pretty low wage in the 40s and 50s. Some do very well, but others end up doing so bad. And in fact, they end up using even day laborers. And that's one thing I was surprised to find out that Long Island had a long history of day laborers. <laughs> um, we're familiar with day laborers as a big issue on Long Island, like the 2000s, largely with Latino immigrants, uh, undocumented, some of undocumented. But this goes back, it goes back to the 1920s, and it was particularly prevalent in the 1950s and 60s as these contractors needed you know, help, extra help. And so they would go to suburban strip malls and corners and pick up mostly men to you know, fill in their daily work. And you know, these men weren't necessarily paid well, they weren't covered by any insurance or social security, but they helped make those houses cheap because their labor was very cheap. Did, did you find, I'm curious now, in terms of contemporary coverage, was that like um, a news a newsworthy story, the, the the migrant worker population, or did you see it popping up? In yeah, it sources? popped up in three ways. Newsday's was fantastic. I mean, the Newsday source mm. and, and Newsday journalists especially did. They did a lot of undercover reporting where, for example, uh, two female journalists would go undercover as, de- as nannies and maids and kind of see what it was like. There was another, I believe, male reporter who did one of those things where he watched as contractors were picking up um, day laborers. And then the third category, which news they got heavily involved in, was the migrant farmers working in Suffolk County. And they would follow them. And, and of course, some civil rights groups got involved, so they were very involved there. So, yeah, there was a bit of coverage. Nothing like we saw with the immigration issue in the 2000s. That became national news, unfortunately, with like Farmingville. But um, it was still newsworthy, absolutely. And and that gives a segue into the maybe the informal housing. So all these migrant workers or day workers where were they living? Yeah. <laughs> so because basically every inch of Long Island, maybe west of Patchogue for the most part, um, is being built up for the mo- you know overall, or at least it's being laid out with laws, like zoning laws, to determine what kind of housing can get built, makes it really hard for people who don't have the money to get a mortgage to live. And of course, they will. someone will find a way to solve that problem. And what I found in my book is that property owners, sometimes landlords, speculators, or just a homeowner, realize they can make a ton of money by chopping up their house into two, maybe an extra apartment, two apartments, sometimes three apartments, and rent them out. Anyone on Long Island knows these illegal apartments, they exist, they're ubiquitous. Maybe you lived in one if you're listening. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe you're in one right now. But um, they were the solution to a problem that was never really addressed, and I would argue still isn't well addressed at the legal level, and that is the dearth of affordable kind of rental housing on Long Island. And essentially, what happens in the post-war Long Island is that people realize this opportunity and they begin kind of turning even sometimes Levittown houses into apartments and renting them. Um, And of course, my book goes in a lot of detail about all sorts of the trouble that these landlords and even these tenants get into because what they're doing is not legal. Yeah, and and you you know there are plenty of examples of um, predatory landlords and and villains of the story. But so you're saying that activity, in some way, is um, an alternative solution to what Long Island had become. And was was there any were there any places doing it maybe safely and you know above board and trying to introduce different types of housing than had been prevalent? Yeah, so it's, it's funny you don't. I use the term informal housing because it's technically not a legal issue. Technically, it's just like, are you up to code? So it's kind of like formal is when you're meeting all the codes and informal is when you're not meeting all the codes. Because um, it would take a lot to actually imprison a landlord. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, I, know, I know. It's amazing sometimes. Yeah, they did. I mean, I had the one guy, James Northrop. He actually was imprisoned um, for three hours, but <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to be in prison for 10 days. But regardless, you have to really be breaking laws to get in trouble there. Usually, you're just, yeah, you're breaking a code, right? You, you don't have a safe entryway or you're not supposed to have two families in this house. It's zoned for one family and things like that. But to answer your question, one of the big issues on the island was... There's two issues. Number one, of course, single-family housing dominated construction up until the 1970s. That's a number. I think 93% of all housing as of 1960 was single-family homes. Um, in the 60s, they began building apartments, but most of these were targeting like what they called luxury apartments. You know, one bedroom, sometimes mm-hmm. two bedroom. A lot of times they were looking for the earliest generation of retirees, <laughs> getting them. So those weren't really in the price point of people who couldn't get a mortgage. 
And then the other problem was um, in the 50s and 60s, a lot of villages, those incorporated villages, were actually doing urban renewal or suburban renewal. I mean, they're actually knocking down some of the low-income housing. That was in pretty bad condition. But by doing that, they actually reduced the amount of affordable apartments available. And if anyone knows this, as you see any construction project anywhere in the country, it takes years to build, knock down and rebuild. And so, for example, in Rockville Center, they knocked down these apartments and it took like a decade or more to even build any new housing. So in 10 years time, these people are going to have to find housing somewhere. And it's that illegal market that will provide them that, that, that housing, even if it's not cheap, even if it's not very safe, it's something and it's near their job and it's what they can afford perhaps. And that's how they get in. You, you mentioned you also go through a lot of, again, bring the feds back in the federal policy level and, and Johnson's, you know, the, the war on poverty in the 60s and a lot of things that I don't know enough to talk <laughs> to intelligently about. But just hearing you from um, FDR, you know, the WPA New Deal on, how consciously do you think or do you know the federal government was looking at Long Island as a place to watch these things play out or try policies or, you know, was that a, did they factor in Long Island as a, as a place to say, all right, this is a place we can try this policy or um, was it on their minds? Yeah. So, you know, not so much Lyndon Johnson himself, per se, but people in his administration. Um, yeah, particularly like the transportation secretary, you know, Charles Haar. But really what they're looking at is that Long Island is exemplar of their motto from the war on poverty, right? Poverty amidst plenty. The idea that like America is this plentiful society, but we have poverty and we shouldn't, right? And we can solve it. And so Long Island was one place among other wealthy places. They're like, well, look, if the war on poverty is going to work anywhere, it's going to work there. <laughs> it's the richest mm -hmm. place in America. All right, 1960, Nassau County is the richest county in the country. <laughs> and they're like, if we can't solve, as the county executive, Eugene Nickerson said, if we can't solve poverty here, then the poor are kind of you know resigned to their desperation. Like there's nothing we can do. And so, yeah, war on poverty policymakers at the federal level are looking to Long Island to see, hey, do these programs work? Can we watch them work? They should work. This is a great kind of laboratory for our programs. And they try a bunch, right? They did a busing program where they tried to create bus routes, which Long Island only didn't used to have public buses. We used to have a, actually Nassau County had 21 private bus companies. So it was like a mess. <laughs> hmm. And not all of them went to areas where the people were of low income. So they actually got money to help fund these free buses that would go from, you know, low-income neighborhoods to job sites like industrial parks. Uh, one of the biggest ones in the country was in Hophog, um, the Vanderbilt Industrial Park. And the idea was maybe that'll solve poverty. And then, of course, they have job training programs and referral programs. And they have all these different kind of programs with the hope that, hey, this is going to do it. This is going to solve poverty. We can use this as a model to apply to other parts of the country. Um, and as I mentioned in the book, it, it doesn't quite work out that way because what they discover is, well, even prosperous places have a whole lot of low-wage jobs. <laughs> hmm. So I have stories of people getting in these buses, going to an industrial park, getting out of the bus and realizing, oh, the wages I can make in this industrial park are no different than what I got back in Hempstead. <laughs> so why waste the hour driving here on the bus? When I could get the, I already had a job that paid me a dollar sixty an hour. Like you know, there, it's not like right, right. You know, so it's not an issue of access. It's not an issue even of training. It's an issue of the actual wages being paid and the kind of jobs available. And and what, in terms of policy or planning, what what moves that lever? What where was it working, if ever, besides the war effort when they were just pumping money into everything? Yeah, so it, it, it's it's hard to say there wasn't too many areas. Um, you know, the one thing I found. I, Look, I had never heard in my life before this book or before studying Long Island of a something called a job guarantee. Have you heard of that before, Chris? No. Yeah. So a job guarantee is essentially this concept that developed during the New Deal a little bit before, but really took off in the post-war period. And it was the idea that the government would create enough jobs that they can guarantee every American a right to a job. It's kind of like a WPA, but you could walk into an office and they would have a job for you. Um, and it was this popular idea. In fact, if, if you've ever read... Um, the freedom budget, you know, Martin Luther King and Bayard Rustin made the freedom budget for all Americans right after the civil rights movement. Um, even the March on Washington was about four jobs and freedom. <laughs> and one of the things they wanted was a job guarantee, this idea of a right to a job. And I was shocked to realize how many Long Islanders were talking about this. And it's partly because many of them were, as you mentioned, were so used to war spending and the government spending and creating jobs that they were like, well, we don't need to have the war to necessarily support job creation. 
And the reason I mention this is because on the local level, a lot of these war on poverty policymakers were arguing we should do a job program. And in fact, Eugene Nickerson, the Nassau County executive, tried to implement the nation's first guaranteed job program in Nassau County. Um, so then, therefore, anyone in the county who was a county resident could go to an office and they would set them up with a, a job program, a public job, you know, uh, building public parks uh, or doing elder care or daycare, child care, whatever it may be, depending on their skill set. And they'd have a job that paid them well and provide them skills, got them to build their resume and that kind of program. Um, and he had it set up and they were going to start it. And then Lyndon Johnson lost his election. Richard Nixon got in and he began mm-hmm. cutting the funding and it never got off the ground. Um, but that was what a lot of local um, policymakers in Long Island were really excited about. Uh, and I see it again and again. I was shocked. I saw it in 1989, 1991. And a lot of the defense workers would talk about this. Whenever there was like job cuts, they were like, wait, wait, don't don't cut those jobs. Like keep these factories open. Like we can do other work. <laughs> right. Find something else. Yeah. yeah but yeah. And, then, you know, it's, it's not a terrible point. Right. I mean, you know, Republic Aviation was a huge 15,000 workers at, you know, in the 1960s. And when they cut the contracts and they closed Republic Aviation, you know, 11,000 people were out of work and Fairchild bought it. And it was a much smaller factory. And a lot of these people had these skills, these skills to build. And, you know, when they went up working as a gas station attendant, they weren't using those skills anymore. And it was kind of a loss for Long Island and a loss, obviously, for them. Now, I have a few sort of big picture questions. Um, one is just in terms of the research we've been talking about, there's a lot of great talk about policy choices and, and that kind of element. But is there an, another person you could bring up just as, as a character or, you know, a person of their time that you discovered just as a, a way to get people to maybe take a look? Sure. So my, my favorite character in the book, and it sounds bad I say he's my favorite character because he's a... Not a great guy. Yeah, it was James Northrop, otherwise known as Long Island Slumlord. (laughs) Um, So James Northrop was a former high school principal in Babylon School District. And he was actually let go. He was fired from his job for uh, physically assaulting 34 children. And then he ended up suing and he got his job back. And then he got fired again because at a parent-teacher conference where parents were like, you're not getting back in the, you know, in the school, he allegedly, according to Newsday, he chased one of the parents down the street with a rake um, in such anger. And so uh, after that, he, they, they got rid of him finally for good. And his first wife, I think he had three wives, uh, his first wife said in a, in a retrospective that he swore he'd become the first millionaire in his family. Like he was going to spite everybody and, and do it. And he learned the way to do it was to get into real estate, essentially buying homes and renting them. First, he started renting to teachers and people he knew from the Babylon School District. He started getting some money. But then he also learned that there was a really effective way to make a lot of money, especially guaranteed rent. And that was to work with the Suffolk and Nassau County Welfare Departments, or social services departments, because again, as I mentioned, Long Island didn't have any public housing or like legal low-income housing. So essentially, the welfare departments who had to kind of find housing for people under state law, they had to rely on the private housing market and sometimes illegal rentals. And so they turned to landlords. And so James Northup realized, hey, if I can get homes, and I go to the, I can call the welfare department, and be like, hey, I got a home for you. You know, they could get their recipients homes. And so he used this knowledge to build up a small amount of money. And then he decided to get into a place called Carlton Park Central Islip. It was a neighborhood in Central Islip of about 300 homes. They weren't built very well. They were built in 1953. And by the late 50s, they were kind of falling apart even. And uh, their homes were foreclosed on. People were losing jobs from the state hospital. And so what ended up happening is people were selling their homes to cash for homes buyers. You may have seen those signs on the street these days. They're they're really popular now because of the high housing prices, right? And these are flippers, essentially. And so these flippers are buying these houses, but they can't necessarily sell them because no one wants to move into this area of central Islip because the homes aren't great. And there's a lot of foreclosures, a lot of empty, vacant homes. So it's not not the safest place. It's kind of empty. So Northrop decides he's going to go in there and he buys 150 of these homes. There's 300 of them. He buys half of them. in about three years. And he calls the welfare department and he puts recipients in all of them. Um, and of course, the way he makes money is by A, getting all this welfare uh, checks to him, but B, making sure he doesn't do much to the houses, include heat them well, include uh, keep maintenance going, and basically do anything to them, keep the costs as low as possible. He ends up killing people because of that. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Laureen Peters, a, a mother, put her uh, year and a half year old, a uh, year and a half uh, year old, um, 
to bed. And about four hours later, she found the baby's dead body. And the baby had died of carbon monoxide poisoning because the furnace was broken, something she had complained about for mm-hmm. <laughs> months to James Northrup. Um, eventually, he's arrested. He gets um, let out after 10 hours after his lawyers helped Sue to get him released. And he actually raises rents in kind of um, in, in, in spite and <laughs> to get back at his tenants. Um, and eventually, he ends up holding the house until he dies in 1981. So he gets him in 1964. And he owns all these homes in 1981. It was, the homes were so in such bad condition by 1981 that many of the residents were actually relying on outdoor spigots. They were using uh. going to the bathroom in the yard because the toilets didn't work. I mean, nothing worked. And you know that's an example of the kind of power someone had in this housing market because rentals were so rare. And he was able to kind of buy up all these homes. He could he became a millionaire. He had a $7 million portfolio of homes across Long Island, and that's in $1980. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the, as we've said this a few times, but the disheartening thing is how contemporary all these examples feel from the 20s up, up through now, that it's just repeating itself or the, you see the same trends. As, as a historian, this is sort of a side question, uh, but it's a trying subject, I would imagine, and, you know, uncovering all these tales of, of poverty, and, you know, you obviously had your, your research question in mind and all that, but... As, as a human <laughs> living through or reliving as you're reading the documents through this somewhat misery and suffering, what's the antidote to that? What did you what did you do to, to maybe cleanse yourself when you had to get away from Northrop or something? That's a good point. So um, a few things. Uh, number one, I, this sounds weird, but I actually got in my car and drove to where Northrop's houses used to be. <laughs> okay. What's um, there now? Well, so that was one of the earliest examples of specifically suburban renewal. The federal government was one of the earliest examples. The federal government actually funded bulldozing suburban homes and rebuilding the mass suburban homes. Um, it's called College Woods. Beautiful. It's right near okay, the good. central islip, the, um, the state Supreme Court and the Ducks Stadium. And it's mm-hmm. a mix of like condos and single family homes. It's really nice. Um, they did a great job. It's st- and it's still nice, meaning like it's been 30 years, you know, 25 years or so. And, you know, it's, it's kept up. It's, it's still really good. So it really is a success story. That made me feel better, uh, <laughs> you know, that they kind of got them. Good, uh, yep. But the other thing too, a lot of times is I, I was honestly shocked at how like how many ideas, like good ideas, like Long Islanders had. And what I mean is not just politicians, but like labor union officials, you know, housewives, uh, homeless families. Like the ideas that they came up with and and talked about in public forums, I was it was really heartening, you know. And and I don't mean to get into politics or things, but you know, sometimes Long Island can be an ugly place politically. <laughs> I, you know, and I mean that in whatever it may be, um, you know, and, and so it was like, oh, like there's this other story that I feel like I don't never heard. Right. But there's actually these people, these run of the mill, salt of the earth people who really had to me ideas that I think would have had an impact. And it's like, oh, if we listen to them and I kind of mentioned them in the conclusion about these ideas were there, they're still there. And when you look at polls of Long Islanders, you realize on issues, not necessarily just political parties, but on issues. Long Islanders have a pretty good, as other people in the country, have a pretty good sense of of, of what to do. Um, it's a question of power and, and getting there. Yeah, and and the, one of the, my takeaways was, you know, it wasn't inevitable, right? The system we have or the landscape we have today was because of choices made from the federal level on down. You could point to d- decisions that, you know, got us to here, but they could have gone a different way, like you're saying. If someone had listened to another plan or, or tried something that worked, it could have been a different outcome. Yeah, and to... To kind of jump on your point about the positives, um, you know, one of the reasons that got me into the book was kind of investigating racial segregation. As we know, Long Island's kind of infamous for being really segregated. Um, and I kind of wanted to figure out why and how it happened. You know, we often got this story, at least I did even growing up, was like, well, Long Island's were just like we're a bunch of horrible racists, you know, and there are racists. <laughs> and there are horrible racists on Long Island, no doubt, as there is everywhere. But the one thing I kind of learned, as you mentioned right now, is like it's policy that created the segregation, right? Regardless of how people responded to it, an individual homeowner is an individual homeowner, right? They're, they're, they're living in a social order they didn't create. Now, they may uphold it. They may threaten the neighbor, you know, the, the black home buyer next door, or they may be okay with it. But the social order is not something they created. They just moved into it or were born into it. And I think that kind of made me feel like, okay, well, that means change is possible, right? We're not, we're not have original sin as racists, <laughs> mm-hmm. but instead it's policy that creates that and we can undo that then. That means there's, there's a path out of it. I think that to me felt like hopeful, if that makes sense. 
No, that that is that's great. And is there anything about the book or the research um, that we haven't asked you that you, you want to mention or make sure we get out there? Oh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I told you some of the good stories, but the, uh, the <laughs> you know some of the interesting stuff always I find kind of. Um, enjoyable is civic associations um <laughs> okay you know, they're kind of the unsung kind of uh, drama uh that if you've ever been to a civic association meeting on island um they're really interesting you know another thing that just to go on a tangent again was was sure. a treasure trove of information was the uh, land records uh, departments in nassau and suffolk counties i didn't know that like I thought I would go to these Nassau County land records. It would be difficult to get in. There'd be nobody there. There wouldn't even be an employee. And no, I get to Nassau County land records and there must be like 30 people in this room. <laughs> and they're running around bustling. I didn't realize, oh, this is like title companies. Oh, that's what they're doing. Here. Oh, okay. And that makes sense. But what was great, especially in Suffolk County, was meeting these title people. And they were so excited to meet in a story. And they're like, you're interested in this stuff? And they showed me how to get through all these property records. And property records are just... Uh, unbelievable amount of information. I mean, you know, if you ever want to go into your house and the history of it, and who owns it, how it was changed. Mm-hmm. And, but beyond that, you can get so much out of it. And that's how I found the racial covenants um, through the property records for Levitt Homes. They were right in there, <laughs> mentioned Caucasian only and everything. Um, but also how these landlords illegally chopped up their houses. It would all be in there. So it is a wrap up question. But who who do you hope reads your book, or who do you who do you want to most? get this book in front of oh <laughs> i would say i'm on the right podcast long islanders um i would say a few people obviously anyone who's interested in i think the history of long island i didn't only try to tell a history of poverty i tried to tell a history of long island through the poor i hope that comes off um because it's not just about the poor it's about defense workers it's about levittown homeowners it's about um you should mention estate owners <laughs> the big wealthy people um, but it is often told through the perspective of the people who don't get to enjoy those benefits. So definitely anyone interested in 20th century history, um, history buffs, hopefully. But also, I, I think one of the big issues, pick up a news day, and any day of this past few years, and affo- housing, housing is the big issue, affordable housing. And um, anyone with you know cares about things like affordable housing, where how their children are going to live, for example, in, in the next generation, if they want to be near them. I like to think this book kind of provides at least how we got to this problem of affordable housing on Long Island and what is being done, what, how this has been solved in the past, and maybe how we could solve it better. Um, and lastly, I don't, I don't know how many politicians listen to this, but <laughs> if any local politicians listen. I, I don't know. I'd be curious to know myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but if they do, I hope I have some, hey, consider these ideas in here. You know, your predecessors sometimes in your positions consider these ideas. And some of them are good. <laughs> and avoid the pitfalls of the, of the politicians who didn't, because there is a political story here, too. And thank you again to Tim. His book is In Levittown's Shadow. That came out last year from the University of Chicago Press. You'll find links and related resources in our show notes. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. And if you have your own story to tell, either research that you've done or a family connection to Long Island's past, if your family came up from the south during the Great Migration, drop us a line. We'd love to talk to you. We're at longislandhistoryproject at gmail.com. And if you're a local politician, let us know you're out there. That does it for this episode. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And, as always, thank you for listening.